Dennis Crone. I'm from the U.S. Geological Survey. I want to thank the University of South Florida for helping us host our speaker. Our speaker today is Jayanta Dokobi Sakara, but everybody calls him Obi. Obi. Yeah. Obi. <laughs> And, the, and you know what? Backwards, they call him Obi Sakara Jayanta, but please, it's just, it's just Obi. Um, Obi's going to talk to us today about a very new concept for the generations. It was found by some USGS people, correct? It yeah, was, they have. You say partly? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the stationarity is one of these concepts that's hard to kind of grasp onto. And so this is a real good opportunity for us to ask questions. <coughs> so please feel free to ask OB questions at the end. There's no such thing as a dumb question. Afterwards, we're all going to migrate, if you want, to the avenue. OB will be there. You can have to ask him more questions. And we convinced him to stay the night. Now, I know a lot of people want to have one-on-one -on -one time with him. So all I can say is give him a big round of applause, ask good questions, and maybe we can get him to come back. So, oh, no. Sorry. I'm not that good, but... <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate. Thank you, Dennis, for organizing. And I, um, thank you to the College of Marine Science for inviting me for this talk. Um, so my background is um, engineering, actually, hydrology. Uh, but lately, uh, I work for the South Florida Water Management District. I've been there for now 28 years. I came to work on Kissimmee River. But lately, I've been working on climate change and sea level rise uh, uh, topic uh, for the last five years. 10 years, and I was a member of the National Climate Assessment Advisory Committee uh, that produced a re report last year, and also was a, a co-author for the NOAA report on sea level rise projection. So this topic has been um, of interest to me for some time. So I'm going to talk about this, cons you know, some a concept that you all know, um, probably return period and risk, uh, but how do we use that in the context of um, non-stationarity? And I will show you that non-stationarity can come from um, various sources, including climate change um, and extreme sea level. So it turns out that the concepts would be applicable for both extreme sea levels and also floods that we, some of the engineers, trying to design floods. So the same conceptual framework. So it's a, a primarily a, a talk on statistical techniques for dealing with uh, future sea levels and storm surge and so forth. Um, but, um, but I'll talk about some applications for both floods and, and stream sea levels. So my topics will be more like causes of non-stationarity, basic, um, some brief introduction to why we worry about non-stationarity. And... How many of you have heard the word non-stationarity? Some of you, I'm sure. <laughs> so the whole idea is like, you know, in uh, planning and design for water management or even, you know, you try to design a coastal um, um, seawall, for example, you assume the past is an indication of the future. You use the tight gauge data or past data somehow. I guess in the case of tight gauge data, the change is obvious, but uh, particularly in the inland uh, water level measurements. Uh, uh, so you typically assume, for example, Everglades restoration in Florida. We assume that the past 50 years and is an indication in terms of climatic regime what we could expect in the future. And obviously, like Dennis said, uh, you know, this was highlighted by a paper from USGS that the, this concept called non-stationarity or stationarity is dead basically because of things like climate change and sea level rise and other things. So how do you, um, you know, uh, teach new students coming out how to account for that in future planning and design and, and science? So, so I'm going to talk about that paradigm shift and then try to apply um, that for three concepts and um, return period risk and sort of the frequency or nuisance flooding that um, I'll show you some examples of nuisance fl flooding in Miami Beach. Uh, that, and also, I will also talk about one more topic on what we call regional frequency analysis. And a lot of times, um, you have to um, look at storm surge or extreme sea level at places where there is no tide gauge. Can you do a regional analysis to come up with those types of uh, estimates? And some example. 
So why, um, what's the reason for this non-stationarity? An obvious one is the human intervention in, um, in various locations, construction of structures, the dams, tunnels, or in the case of urban areas like where we are perhaps, the urbanization, irrigation, deforestation. So all these are changes that will actually um, be reflected in your data um, in terms of most likely the periodic change or positive change or negative change or systematic trends that you need to account for going forward. Um, so that's uh, you know, sort of the obvious reason for non-stationarity. Then obviously things that we have been talking about lately is the natural climate variability and we know very well things like Enso, El Nino, Southern Oscillation, PDO or AMO will kind of add to this natural climate variability and that would be reflected in your data. Uh, for example, in some cases the extreme sea levels, you can see a clear signal of these you know, teleconnections or multi-decadal cycles. And then the climate change obviously most recent um, you know, attention, uh, increase air temperature, moisture in the atmosphere, and, and you know all this, and, and particularly uh, reflected in the form of um, mean sea level and extreme sea levels. And so how do you account for this change that we have observed going into the future when you try to plan a particular project on the coast or, or inland? So, this is what, we, what I talked about. There is this paper from USGS that kind of highlighted to the entire water resources community. The stationarity is dead, and what do we do now? And this is something you don't find in textbooks that we teach or learn. So that's the whole um, topic got a lot of interest in the last five years, particularly in the water resources community. So the last two times I've been in talking about non-stationarity, I almost got thrown out of the room because there were people who didn't believe in non-stationarity. But I think this is a friendly crowd. They won't, you won't throw me out, right? <laughs> so uh, anyway, so there are uh, uh, evidences uh, globally that you probably have seen uh, increasing frequency of major floods in countries like Pakistan, Russia, and China um, that, you know, you wonder what are the, you know, you see the Northeast in terms of climate, um, you know, the more and more frequent events of extreme um, uh, incidents, incidences of extreme events happening. So that's kind of some pictures I wanted to show you. And this picture actually is from Sri Lanka, where I come from. Uh, this particular baby elephant got stuck in a tree during a flood, actually, unfortunately. Um, and then obviously the obvious one is the Hurricane Sandy. Uh, you all remember that, you know, these eerie pictures of water gushing into a subway that was like in a movie. So in that case, even the governor, I thought, recognized non-stationarity when he said that the frequency of extreme events, you know, extreme weather is way up. And I thought that was a statement from a politician that non-stationarity is happening. So let me talk about some examples of data and obviously um, since you all are probably more interested in sea level than floods, so I'm going to kind of try to focus on that. So if you look at the, all the tide gauges around the U.S. or even around the world, you see the mean sea level increasing with trend, you know, globally you have about what 1.7 millimeters, but in the last 20 years what, about three millimeters per year rate of increase since the satellite era. Um, and then, you know, you look at the extreme, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, you look at the extreme values in the mean, uh, the annual extremes, and, and then what I saw was, you know, pretty remarkable correspondence between, obviously, and this is probably well known, that the extreme values, although in, you know the difference between the mean and the extremes could change from location to location for good reasons, they pretty much follow the same kind of trend. And so I was trying to use that particular relationship to see, can I predict the extremes into the future? 
Now, obviously, um, the, you know, there are issues like the storminess may change in the future. When the sea level is increasing, your storms may surge also may increase. So there are some nonlinear effects that you eventually have to account for. So this is the kind of the basis for some of the work I'm going to talk about. And then you have, uh, when you look at the tide gauges around the state, and we, you know, I'm in South Florida, we are trying to look at um, South Florida issues, but you see the pretty much, um, you got multi um, interannual or even decadal variability in tide gauge data, um, you know, primarily sometimes due to El Nino and other phenomena. Um, but it, the, the rate is pretty similar to the global one, which is shown in red. Um, but uh, maybe slightly higher because of perhaps the land subsidence because this is the relative sea level rise. Uh, so, so this is the non-stationarity which we all have known, clear increasing trend in sea level. So going forward, how do you use that to your plan your projects on the coast? Basically, that's the problem that I'm trying to solve. So let me show you some actually examples in the case of floods. Um, this is the um, New Jersey annual maximum flood clear increases in the floods, um, in this case primarily due to urbanization, urban growth, um, increasing extreme floods, or could be rainfall changes. And in, the, in this particular case, Washington State, again urbanization was flat for a while, then the growth happened and then sort of built out and then probably flattening. So you got a different way of systematic trend uh, in this case. And then there's a mountainous floods in Iran, actually. I got some data. Basically, the snow melt floods um, changing with time. So clear definition of trends. And um, so you can um, do all kinds of statistical testing to see if this is a natural variability or is that a significant trend and various statistical tests you can apply. And then you have this situation where what we call shifting floods, or even in the case of extreme sea level, shifting um, mean level. This is St. John's River. Clearly, this has been tied to the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation that you have. Um, and, and you see that very clearly in Florida, South Florida in particular, um, the shifting means basically uh, in terms of rainfall or floods. So that's one aspect on the coastal area. Then you also have rainfall possibly changing in the future because of climate change issues. Um, this is a place called Delray Beach in South Florida, close to where I am. Had like 22 inches of rainfall in um, something like 24 hours. And that was a lot, and there was a lot of flooding associated with that. And so that's, a, that's another reason. So you got this the probability of having a high rainfall during a um, high tide event causing all kinds of problems. So I'm getting up to the reason why I'm trying to look at um, you know, this issue. So <coughs> if you, this is Miami Beach, this is South Florida, you got these coastal structures and these are planned and designed in the 1950s by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and even on this course you have few so these were designed in the 50s and they had, they did not account for the kind of sea level rise we are going to expect today. I mean, you read the document, there's no mention of that very much. They didn't expect probably to be high, you know, by this time. So these control structures that we manage basically are not functioning twice a day. We cannot open these structures because the tidal levels are higher than the canal levels that they serve. So that's a real serious problem. So kind of um, to um, explain, let me see if this works. Um, so what's happening, basically, um, so you got these coastal structures, basically, and a lot of times with the sea level rise and high tide, we can't open these structures. So if the canal is basically surcharging due to, to rainfall, then basically we have a serious situation because we can't open the gates to let the water out. These are actually called salinity barriers because they were built originally to prevent salt water coming inland, but they had to put the gates to let the flood waters out. So, so you know, basically that is the situation and it could flood the land if we can't open the gates during high tide. 
And then, um, so we also have uh, the other issue is basically the salt water intrusion into our oil fields that I'm not going to talk about. Um, so going forward, try to set the problem up. You know, what do we expect in the future? Um, this is the National Climate Assessment um, projections: one to four feet by 2100. Um, so I was involved in the NOAA report, and we kind of gave a scenario-based approach because of the lot of uncertainty in ice sheet melting. So we realized that you know it's almost impossible to predict exactly what could be the sea level rise by 2100. So we gave the scenarios to the National Climate Assessment lead authors, and they said, no, it's not going to work. They wanted to give a kind of a definite projection. They came up with one to four feet. Uh, because we are very flat in South Florida, even one foot is a lot. So we'll kind of show you what. Um, so then the Corps of Engineers had. So this is, these are the kind of scenarios we're looking into the future. So if I'm planning a project for 50 years or you know, even 30 years, how do we design for that expected increase or plan for that? So it turns out that we have a lot of these structures all along South Florida, even on this coast. And these red ones are the ones which are most vulnerable. And in Miami, two or three structures we can't open during king tide, we can't open twice a day. So in that particular time frame, if there's a storm event, there's a potential for flooding. It hasn't happened yet, but that's kind of a situation that could happen. So you, you see that, that kind of, uh, that's a picture of a structure that I'm talking about, salinity barrier. So when we look at the water levels downstream, just like tide gauges, we already see a you know, increasing trend in the tra uh, water levels. And so that's why we have to keep the water levels, um, you know, uh, uh, gates short, closed. So these are some of the pictures we are seeing already. Palm Beach, you know, lots of, um, effects on the, on the, very close to the houses. Uh, five blocks of A1A in Fort Lauderdale two years ago got washed off because of an offshore uh, storm event and that did pretty much a lot of damage. And this is a Miami Beach, what we call a sunny day flooding basically. A uh, poor person here is trying to figure out what is going on, you know, there's no rainfall but Basically, this is during high tide water coming back into the street um, through storm drain systems and flooding. I'll show you a video that is amazing. And this is another picture. Again, it's a sunny day flooding. This is the dry house and the storm inland and water coming into the, into the streets. And obviously, this is not something you want to do. It's dirty water. <laughs> Uh, so that's a, this is a common occurrence in many places in some parts of South Florida. And basically water is coming back through the storm sewer system. So now I'm getting to the more interesting part of it. I hope you won't go to sleep <laughs> on me now because I'm going to throw a lot of equations at you. Uh, I'll show you some pictures along the way. So here's the problem. So now Typically, we assume in hydrology in textbooks, you know, things are stationary. They don't change with time. You have a probability distribution and you have an exceedance probability we try to design for. And uh, this, so this is the stationary world, basically. Um, things don't change with time. So it turns out that this concept of return period that we have been using, if I couch it in a way that um, in a certain way, I can extend that to the non-stationary case, and that's what I'm going to show you. So this particular problem, what is the probability distribution of extreme floods? So if I assume, let's say, X is the waiting time for the first occurrence of a flood, you know, or extreme sea level, it turns out that um, it, it is a well-known geometric distribution of Bernoulli, basically a, based on Bernoulli trials. So it's a ge geometric distribution, and based on that, the expected value of that waiting time is equal to 1 over P of, uh, in, in traditional sense that you all may know, return period. So, so if I define my return period as the expected value of the waiting time for that first occurrence, that's what I'm trying to do so I can easily extend that to the non-stationary case. So. That's kind of the background for the stationary case. So the, this is the non-stationary case. This is the Key West data. So basically, I'm trying to see what I should be worrying about 
So in, at some point in time, I have to kind of say, okay, if I'm designing a seawall, what should that height be? But I know my, there's a non-stationary increase in uh, extreme sea level. Uh, so how do I define a return period? Because the, now the return period is changing with time. So I'm trying to define a new concept of return period that doesn't change with time. And so this is the basic problem. Uh, how do I design for that to have a certain level of protection over that planning uh, period? So it turns out that the, uh, the concept of waiting time could be applicable to the same case, but now the exceedance probabilities are changing with time because of non-stationarity. So it turns out that you get a similar distribution and it, it is a non-homogeneous geometric distribution. Earlier it was a homogeneous geometric distribution, now it's a non-homogeneous one. And I have a probability distribution of the waiting time in a fairly nice close form, but you do need to know the, the changes in the probabilities. And that's kind of what we did in this work we had done. And it turns out that now the return period is given by this expected value and then have a nice closed form solution. So now I have an interesting uh, um, formula for return period, but in the, my case exceedance probabilities change with time. So I only need to know the, how the probabilities change with time so I can say, okay, what should be my initial P value that I need to design for to have a certain return period? Or if I um, define a return period, I can compute, or if I know the, how the probabilities change, I can compute the return period over, um, over a certain time. So that is the basic problem that we have. So now I have a closed form solution for this non-stationary return period. And I, I will show you some examples of that. It turns out there is another definition I could use based on the number of events over a particular time frame, like 50 years or 40 years, and that's given by this formula. And in this case, if I say my concept is I will all allow only one exceedance over a period of t years, I will define the return period that way. In other words, over the, my return period, I will only allow one exceedance, and that's kind of the the second alternative definition, but I will not use that for now. So it turns, we can extend this to the concept of risk and reliability. So what is my risk of exceedance once you design a project? And that is given by this formula, or the reliability is one minus the risk. So now we